Thank you, worship team. Well, Merry Christmas. Am I allowed to still say that? All right. I love it. Man, it's been an incredible Christmas for us. And, and just having kids and, and just the joy that watching on the, their, their face as they, they come down on Christmas Eve or day, which I'll be honest, I wasn't there, but I've heard about it. Um, I was sleeping. Uh, and then they come and wake you up, and you just see that joy. And it's just such an incredible time. But an, another thing that's been just really incredible for, for me is this sermon series, uh, Gentle and Lowly. Um, Pastor has brought some strong messages and, and really just helped me to recenter my view of Jesus. I love this passage that, that this sermon came out of, this series came out of. It says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ will give you rest. Man, what a word for this year. Amen? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Christ is gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an incredible word for us in this season. Guys, and over the last second, uh, several weeks, I've learned so much about our great Savior. I've learned about how he loves me and how he desires the best for me. And it comes out in these two incredible words, gentle and lowly. Gentle in the New Testament is used three times. And it is, is in our translations, it comes out as meek and humble and gentle. And what I love most about, about seeing these words and th this, this passage, this the saying that Jesus gave to us is that Jesus' posture to us is not him pointing a finger out and saying, you're a sinner. Rather, his posture to us is the posture of his arms open wide, saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And he gives us a promise that he will give us rest. What an incredible passage for this season. But it doesn't end there. He says he is lowly. He is lowly. And as I dig into this and, and I start applying it to my life, what I see is that Jesus comes to us. He's come to us. He became a man. He understands our afflictions. He lived our life. And because of that, he, we can go to him and we can trust him. Church, see our gentle and lowly Savior. I love that we can, we're going to end this series on one of my favorite passages of all time. Is actually uh, the passage my Bible teacher uh, made me memorize when I first became a believer. And I understand why. Because if we understand this passage and we apply it to our lives, it'll radically change who we are. It'll change our families. It'll change our church, change our community. It'll change the world. Guys, when we come to the Bible, when we go to the Bible in our quiet time or we gather in church, we should long to, to understand what God is showing us about himself, what he's showing us about ourselves, and we need to apply it to our lives. And guys, and I pray that you would do that today with this passage. And today we're going to read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. So if you're a Bible, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me as we read. It says this. It says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Let me say that one more time. 
Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality God with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself, assuming the form of a servant. Taking on the likeness of humanity, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your incredible example to us. And I pray, Lord, that, that we would take this example and as we dig into this passage, that, that we would see who you are. And then you've given us this, this challenge to adopt the same attitude as you. And God, so as we read this and we study this together, let us dig in and God, let us leave applying this passage to our lives, Lord. We don't want to leave here the same as we came. We want to be more like you. So Jesus, bless our time together. Amen. What an incredible passage that we have here. What an incredible example that we have in Christ. You know, I I will challenge you to, to look at the world around and look at our culture today and, and see if, if our culture aligns up with this passage or it's all about the self. And I would challenge you to, and, and say that today's culture is more about the self than it is about being like Christ, being a, a humble servant. You can see it in athletes and how they communicate and how they talk. You can see it in our TV shows. And one of my favorites is The Office. And you see Michael Scott and the main character in The Office. Everything is always about him, especially in the early seasons. And, and guys, that, that show is such a, uh, a cultural, it just teaches so much about our culture and, and what it's like today. But guys, it doesn't end with our sports and our celebrities. It also goes to our music I would just challenge you to go listen to the radio today, right? And everything's about clubbing and drugs and girls and and about pleasure. You have Aloe Black who sings, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. Yes, I am, yes, I I can't sing, but you get the point, right? And so he, he, all he's talking about, he's the man. Look up to me because I'm the man. I've done all these dumb things, but I'm the man. I don't have any regrets. And culture follows that. It's all about the self, right? And some of you are like, yeah, uh, music's horrible today. It's all about the self. I agree. Culture today is horrible. We weren't like that when I was a kid. We didn't learn this from, we learned this from you guys. Every generation learns from the previous generations. Let me challenge you to go back to Frank Sinatra, right? I love Frank Sinatra. Right? I'm a youth pastor who wears a suit. Right? I love Frank. But Frank tells you that he did it his way. He has no regrets on the things that he's done because he's done it his way. Guys, culture since Genesis 3 is fallen and is all about the self. Right? It's all about the self. And you know what? We have a lot of examples in the Bible about this. In Matthew chapter 20, we see this fascinating verse. Jesus had just told his disciples that he's going to die. And yet we we have this really interesting story where James and John's mom comes up to Jesus. She's probably looking over her shoulder, making sure nobody else is around. She's like, hey, Jesus, hey, when your kingdom comes, can my children, my sons, James and John, be in the place of prominence in your kingdom. She looks around. And Jesus is like, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. What I'm about to do, you can't handle. Neither can your sons. And she's like, no, 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 really. Can, can my children be in the place of prominence? And guys, I tell you what, the disciples... They overheard this. They overheard this conversation. And it says they were indignant. And I can just imagine, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was with you in the wilderness. I, I, I didn't have a place to sleep. 
No, no, I saw you heal Lazarus or raise Lazarus up. I saw you heal the leopard. And Peter's like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, I walked on water. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. It's all about me. And that's not the example that we have in Christ. Christ calls us to something so much better. His expectations for us are different than the world's. My question for us today is why do we run to the world's expectations? Why don't we adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus? Why? Philippians 6, 2, 6 goes on to say this. Christ, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Something to be exploited. Right? Jesus is God. He was with God in the beginning. Before the foundation of this world. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was with God in the beginning. He doesn't have a beginning and an end. He is part of the Godhead. He's part of the Trinity. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, he is God. He's God. And if anybody has any reason to exploit his position and his power... It would be Jesus. It would be Jesus. But he didn't. He didn't think it was something to be exploited. Think with me just for a moment. Just just ponder about who Christ is. Ponder about just the richness of who he is. As I was just thinking through this and and we had this really cool, like, Bethlehem star thing that happened. And, and, and I love planets and ast- astronomy. And, and it just got me thinking as, as I was processing through this passage of just how incredible God is. Guys, when God spoke, everything was created. He is rich in power. When he spoke, the, the world and every, the stars, the sun, just everything was created. Guys, he took dirt and created us. He is all powerful. I, I look at the sun, our sun, it's so incredible. However many mi- millions of miles we are away of that thing, and it gives us the perfect amount of heat. Our sun's 109 times larger than our planet. The surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They say the core It's 27 million degrees inside. That's incredible. And God created that with his words. But guys, our our sun is small potatoes compared to other stars. Think of Beetle Guys, which is 950 times larger than our own planet, our own sun. 950 times. It's huge. It's huge. But it but there are other more powerful stars. You have these blue stars that are so hot. You got Eta Carian, Carini, which the surface of that star is 127,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't even imagine what the core of that star, star is like. And guys, all, to say that, I want you to think of this. God holds all that in the palm of his hand. He is powerful. He's powerful. This is God. This is the Christ. The one who did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Guys, he was rich in in wealth, if you will. He had no needs. It says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has no needs. He makes the richest sheik who could get on his private A380 
and fly anywhere in the world or have all the cars and the yachts. He makes them look like peasants. We can't even compare. We can't even fathom. Because he's rich in angelic worship. When he's in heaven, as he's in heaven, the angels are worshiping him because of who he is. We have every reason to worship him. Amen. It's not narcissistic for him to enjoy the praise of his people. He's God. He's the highest being. There's nothing greater than him. He deserves all the praise in the world. Glory. This is God, but he did not think that being God was something to be exploited. He emptied himself of all his will and his prerogatives. He was poor, born as a young child, as a baby. And we get to celebrate this, that this Christmas. The God of this universe stepped out of heaven and came as a child. He emptied his will and his prerogatives and became one of us. It's hard to believe, it's hard to even fathom. And Bruce Ware is a, a theologian in, in, as I was studying for this, Pastor Jason kind of led me to this book. And one of his examples, of, and, and I'm just, I, I, have a, I, I need examples to wrap my head around things. And, and he, Bruce Ware uses this example of this king who looks out on his, on his people and he enjoys and he loves them and he's looking out and he goes and he walks among his people one day. And, he, and he's, he sees his people, he sees some, some poor homeless people. And he goes back to his kingdom or his, his palace. He takes off his clothes. He puts on the clothes of the commoner and he goes and lives amongst the poor. And he becomes one of them. Now, he's still the king. He's still the one who rules the kingdom. He can go back to his palace at any time. He can eat, go eat the fine foods. He can go sleep in his cozy bed. He can be waited on hand and foot by his servants, but he chose not to. It's crazy. We would never, ever do that. But that is exactly what Christ did. Because Christ emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Taking on the likeness of humanity. Just imagine what it must have been like for Christ. To be being worshipped in one moment. And the next moment he is being born as a baby. took on the likeness. He became man. He was fully God and fully man. He took on humanity on, on, onto himself. And, and guys, he wasn't born in a palace with servants in, in a cozy bed and food and, and drink and, and everything taken care of for him. No, he was born to a woman who was pregnant out of wedlock to a poor stepfather he was a carpenter. He wasn't even born in his family's hometown. He was born, he wasn't even born in Jerusalem where people go to worship him. He was born in Bethlehem, which is a small podunk town outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And when he was born, they didn't have any room for his mother to give birth, so they sent her to where the cattles stayed overnight. Guys, this wasn't a luxuries, a luxuries hospital, right? Where you have beds, where you have doctors and nurses and it's completely sanitary and you have this, that neat little warming device that they put your child under after he's born, right? No, it was not that at all. He was born in a stable amongst animals. Animals, because I don't know about you, but whenever I go to the Kendall County Fair for the, for the students' uh, stuff, 
uh, for their auctions. And um, I, I tell you what, when I walk in, it stinks. Animals smell. Why do they smell so bad? Well, they're probably rolling in stuff, right? I know the students, like, they clean them off and they make them look all pretty. But the animals are still going to, to the bathroom in that, that bedding. They're still eating there, and they're still doing what animals do. It's gross, and that's how Jesus was born. He was a, born amongst livestock where they were going to the bathroom, it was unsanitary. It was clean. He became a servant for us. He left heaven and became a man. I, I can't even fathom what it must have been like for him. Christ, the king, stepped out of heaven, became one of us. Why? Why? Goes on to say, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. As you dig into this passage with me just a little bit more, I want you to see something just specific that, that really stuck out to me. He took on the form, and some of your translations say slave. I'll say if you have your phone, highlight that passage, that verse. If you have your Bible, go ahead and circle that word, servant or slave. And guys, let me just tell you something. Slaves don't have rights. In the Roman world, if you were a slave, you gave up everything. You were just property of somebody else. And Jesus took on the form, and in some of our translations say slave. He took on the form of a slave. The king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who created everything, became a slave. And guys, let me just tell you this something. He did it willingly. Nobody forced him to do this. This was his choice because he loves us. And he knew that the only way we were going to be reunited with him, to have redemption, was for him to take on this form. He became a slave for us. Mark 10.45 tells us that Jesus came not to, to be served, but to serve. There's a, a passage that is, um, Pastor Jason spoke on it um, real early when he got here, and I still remember the visuals of the towel and the basin and all that stuff, but uh, in John uh, chapter 13, Jesus is, is getting ready to go be crucified. And, and he's the guest of honor at this meal and he's reclining and he's enjoying his people. But he does something strange and in the middle of this meal he stands up. And, he, and, I, and I can imagine what the disciples must have been thinking. He stands up and he goes over to this, this basin and this, this pitcher and he starts to pour water in this, ba this, this bowl. And they're like, this is getting weird. What's going on? And then he takes off his his cloak, his outer clothing, and he lays it down. And he goes and gets a towel and ties around his waist. And he starts walking over to his disciples with the basin of water and the towel around his waist. And he's about to wash their feet. Guys, in Jewish culture, you did not wash people's feet. It's not for a Jew to do. It's for a servant to do. It's for a Gentile servant to do. The lowest man in the room did it. And yet Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, their rabbi, was getting ready to wash their feet. And I can just imagine, I would have, what, what the disciples must have felt like. And, and Peter was like, no, 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 you can't do this. I won't let you wash my feet because they knew what was going on was not what they're accustomed to, to, to do. What their, their, their culture said was inappropriate. And Jesus is like, no, I have to do this. Why? Because Jesus is a servant. He emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Jesus became the servant of the disciples and he would ultimately become the servant of all of mankind. 
because it doesn't end there. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We move into the last portion of this passage. And what we just saw was really radical in and of itself, of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. It was incredibly radical. But what we see in this, in this next passage in Philippians is that something unheard of happens. And that Jesus became obedient to the point of death and death on the cross. Guys, I, I want you to consider for me what that means. The, the cross was an instrument of brutality. I know we, 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 we lose sight of that because if you're like me, you wear your cross around your necklace or your neck, right? It just becomes kind of something there. Or you, maybe you have a cross tattooed on your body and it's just something that, that we have around. Guys, the church would not adopt the cross as its symbol for several hundred years. Why? Because it was an abomination. In Roman culture, if you were in the upper elite of, of Rome, you would not talk about the crucifixion or a crucifixion. It was impolite, it was disgusting, it was the worst form of death, and even the polite society refused to talk about it. And guys, you gotta think about what, how crazy that is. They rejoiced in, in bloodshed and just grotesque things. And you think of the Colosseum where people were eaten by lions and, and, and just blood, the bloodshed that happened there. And yet they refused to talk about the crucifixion because it's so horrible. And in Jewish culture, in Deuteronomy 21, it says that the person who's, who's hung on a tree is beyond regeneration. Guys, th th this is, we lose sight of what the cross is. Jesus would have been taken and he would have been beaten with a cat nine tails and his flesh would have been ripped off his, his back and his chest. His whole body, you wouldn't be, even be able to recognize him. The beating before the crucifixion would have been so bad. And then they would have taken him, they would have thrown him on the cross. And they would have taken one arm and stretched it out and impaled his arm on the cross. And then they would, they would have taken the other one and done the same thing. They would just have enough men that he could pull himself up. And then they would raise him up and, and nail his feet to the, to the cross. Where they put that nail was next to a nerve ending. So every time he would try to pull himself up to breathe, it would be just the worst pain. And he would have to pull himself up to breathe and, 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 and he would have to just struggle nonstop. Guys, the pain was immense. You would end up dying because you would either suffocate or you would die from the extreme pain of your muscles locking up, or your heart would just give out. The cross was horrible. But you know what's worse than the cross? It's the shame that Jesus must have felt. The shame. All of his earthly support was gone. They were gone, they fled. His friends gave way to shaming abandonment. His reputation gave way to shaming mockery. He was spit on and laughed at and jeered at. If you're the king, come down. Yet Jesus knew that he couldn't because he was our savior. He could have if he wanted to. He didn't have to endure this. He chose to. His decency gave way in shaming nakedness. He was hung on the cross naked for everyone to see. His own mother was there. How embarrassing, how shameful. He was impoverished, 
He was hungry. His glorious dignity gave way to the underlying undignity. It was degrading. The God of this universe was on the cross and his reflexes of grunting, of groaning and screeching. Worst of all, Jesus cries out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? As he takes the sin of the world, and your sin and my sin, all their sins, past, present, future of humanity, he takes it on himself. And in that moment, the shame and the pain were unbearable. And he felt so alone and isolated. The son who was God. Was God in the before? Or from all eternity past and will for all eternity future. Church, I want you to see our gentle and lowly king. He was willing to step out of heaven to come as a lowly man. He understands what it's like to be you and me. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to be hungry, to be sad. He knows what it's like to be joyful, to lose loved ones. He knows what it's like to go through puberty. He was tempted just like you and me, but he did not sin. He grieved. Jesus knew what it was like to be us, our gentle and lowly king. But where do we start? We started with this, that we are to adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. We are to adopt the same attitude as him. who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality God with God something to be exploited. Instead, he, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, we are very fortunate that we do not face that kind of persecution in this country, but people all, all over the world do. While we are fortunate now not to face it, we may one day face that type of persecution. But in this passage, what we see is that we are called to do what Christ has done. Guys, Jesus did not come to be served, but rather to serve. What if you and I did the same? What if we did the same? What if we chose to be servants instead of the kings of our own little worlds? What would your family look like if you chose to serve your spouse and your children like Christ has served you? What, students, what would it be like if you would choose to serve your parents what would your home be like? What if you chose to serve the, the kid at school who has no friends or is looked down upon? What would that look like? Or what if you're at work, instead of trying to, to step on people to get to the next level, what if you served your people in your place of work? What would it be like? Guys, I, I'm, I'm gonna suggest something to you. If the church would actually follow through and be like Christ, something radical would happen. We would start to see revival in our homes. We would see revivals in our church. We'd see revivals in our city. We'd see revival in our land. If the church would stand up and be like Christ, to follow his example. My question is, what is holding us back from doing just that? Why do we refuse to, to follow Christ's example here? 
God, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like the time is urgent. I don't know when Christ is coming back, but I'm watching society go downhill and we're becoming less and less interested in Jesus because the church refuses to follow the example of Christ. When are we gonna stand up and be like him? And so in this time, I'm, we're gonna have a time of response. And I want you to consider this in your own life. I want you, in, in this time when the band comes up and starts to play, ask yourself, where do I need to become more like Christ? Where do I need to become, become a servant? Is it in my family or my place of work? Is it with my children? Is it, is it with my neighbors? What is it? What is it? For some of you in this room, I would be remiss to think that everybody in this room is saved. That you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The first thing you need to do to become obedient like Christ, become a servant, is to become a follower of Jesus. So for somebody in this room, or maybe online, you need to become a follower of Christ. I don't know where you are with Jesus. But if you can't read that passage and not want more of Jesus, or to become more like him, check your heart. Guys, don't leave this, don't leave this time without changing. When we come to the word, no matter how many times we read something, we should be changed by the word. What is God doing in your life? I'm gonna pray and the band's gonna play. Just take the time to reflect. Ask God what you need to do. Jesus, thank you so much for, for letting us be here together. Thank you for your word. God, you were the servant of all. You took on the form of, a, of us man. You became man, 100% man. You dealt with the things that we have dealt with you, you came as the God of this universe, not to, to be served, but to serve. And you did it by dying on the cross for our sins. God, let us become more like you. Bless this time of response and God, just make clear what we need to do in our lives.